So once again, thank you very much, Sheila. Uh, this is a slide of the state of my soul. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's a black screen. So um, there's a little bit of history behind this. As Legionary of Christ, I think everyone here remembers Father David Barton, right? Okay, yeah, he's in Jerusalem right now. So Legionaries, we have a pretty big presence in the Holy Land. We run the Notre Dame Center in Jerusalem, which is a piece of Vatican property, literally across the street from the Christian Quarter, from the old city. So it's like walking from here to you know, the entrance to the park there uh, to get into the Christian Quarter. And we've been running that since 2004. And then a few years later, one of our priests got inspired. He says, well, Mary Magdala was an important person, so why don't we build a place here. It's just a piece of grass. And they start digging and they discovered the old town of Magdala there. So so now we have that. So now we've got two places there, which means that we tend to do a lot of Holy Land trips. And we have been a big presence in Rome. Like when I was there back in the glory years, there were like 400 of us studying in Rome. Now we don't have anywhere near that many, but still a solid number of us. Um, so a lot of people associated with with us go to either Rome or the Holy Land. And I said, Dad, come on, I'm gonna do something different, okay? Everyone goes to see, like, when you go to the Holy Land, pretty much you're seeing the Gospels. I said, what came after the Gospels? The Acts of the Apostles. So, ta -ta -ta, even though we marketed it as a footsteps of St. Paul, in my mind, can you even see that? It's kind of still blurry because we've been moving it. No, it's, it's, good. Okay, it's, it's good, but it could be better, so how's that? <laughs> uh, there you go, look at this. It's we're perfectionists here. Anyway, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see the picture better. Um, I said, we're going to do the Acts of the Apostles pilgrimage. And the idea was this. If you look, <clears throat> when Christ was crucified, he himself said shortly before he was crucified, unless a, a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains a single grain. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. And that is exactly what happened. When Christ was crucified, the seed of divinity was planted in our earth, in our world. And immediately afterward, three days later, it began to sprout. And the sprouting meant that God was able to do this outpouring of the Holy Spirit into the world. And if you read the Acts of the Apostles, although there are, it's a funny story because <clears throat> if you read it, you say, who is the protagonist? Because it begins with, uh, well, Pentecost, and then you get Peter and John doing a few things, and then you get the ordination of the deacons and St. Stephen and the persecution, and then Paul and Barnabas show up, and then Paul kind of takes over, and he's like, who's the hero of this story? And the answer is? God. Jesus. Jesus. Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. And the idea is this. You have this movement that from the moment of the resurrection, God's grace, you know, the city of God, which was Jerusalem, was the beginning point. And usually by means of persecution, some the group would get together, things people would start getting excited, some sort of persecution would happen, and then the church, they would have to disband and expand into new lands. First he went to Samaria, then St. Peter went over to, I forget, the Syrophoenician country, I forget which town it was, but it would be modern day... Um, Lebanon, and then they made it as far as Antioch, where the Christians were first called Christians, and they moved into, and the, with the coming of St. Paul and Barnabas, when they received that inspiration through, through the prophecies in Antioch, they said, set aside Paul and Barnabas for the, for the mission I have for them, to go into the Gentile territories. Now, Israel was in the very eastern outskirts of the Roman Empire, as we know, right? Rome politically was Roman, but culturally the cool part, so all the great philosophers and everything, all the, the language, the cool language in the Roman Empire was Greek. Um, so every, every well-educated Roman was at least bilingual, Greek and Latin, and then whatever else they may have picked up. Um, so in the Roman Empire, the Greek-speaking world was kind of the cool spot, plus the city of Rome, okay? So Paul, on his first missionary voyage with Barnabas, goes through, goes into modern-day Turkey, which at the time was totally, that was Hellenic Greek territory. You think about Alexander the Great came down, and he 
spread you know his influence all the way through pretty much all the way almost to the Holy Land he actually made it into the Holy Land but uh, his cultural influence was all the way from Greece all along that northeastern side of the Mediterranean this is where St. Paul and Barnabas went and you think about why did God choose St. Paul well in the when Jesus first chose his 12 apostles for the most part who did he pick a bunch of blue-collar guys right seemingly Matthew probably had somewhat of an education and probably Judas I don't know if anybody else out of the 12 was particularly educated most of them were blue-collar guys they worked the fields they fished they did whatever they did well, we don't even know what most of them did um, and they were culturally not equipped to go out and to you know go to Athens and deal with the disciples you know the followers of Plato for example what's a guy like St. Peter gonna do in dialogue with one of them I mean he can work miracles God can obviously inspire anybody when we are saints St. Joan of Arc was a great example of that but by and large Christians you know the early church did not have members capable of that okay um, and then all of a sudden one day God strikes a man named Saul of Tarsus. Now Saul was a very unique guy. He grew up in Tarsus, which means, well, he was, first of all, he was born, as he himself says, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. Among the Pharisees, I was of the very strictest branch of them. I was a disciple of Gamaliel, who was one of the most respected Pharisees there was. He appears in the Acts of the Apostles. Interestingly enough, he told the other Pharisees that said, look, if these guys did not come from God, leave them alone because they will self-destruct. And if they did come from God, well, leave them alone because you're not going to win. <laughs> and it's, it made it sound like, oh, they thought that what Gamaliel said was great. So all they did was scourge Peter and John. And then they'd be like, something didn't connect. But anyway, so Gamaliel seemed like he was a good guy. St. Paul was his disciple, but he grew up in Tarsus. Tarsus was in the middle of Greek society. So my best analogy, actually in resurrection, you would have people similar. Okay, let's take a highly educated, oh, gotta lean up, okay, sorry, but I know you so I can do this. Let's take a highly educated Latino who is absolutely comfortable in two cultures. Okay, sorry, Carol, I know you're gonna blush and everything. You're not the only one, but uh, that's the best analogy here. In this parish, we have any number of people that come from other countries, probably grew up with another language, in your heart of hearts, you're probably, you know, from whatever country you're from, but you have come and because you are well educated and you've spent time in this country and you've adapted and you're pretty seamless, like Caro can fit into any group, Latino or Anglo or whatever, she fits in perfectly well. I know she's going to kill me later, but, <laughs> but it's true, okay? St. Paul was like that. He was as Hebrew as you can be, but he also completely understood the Greco-Roman mind. He grew up in a Greco-Roman hub. He knew their culture, their literature, their philosophy, their language, you know, the, the expressions. He knew what was going to go down well and what wouldn't. And he was a genius. And he was studied in the law and he was passionate. And the conversion that St. Paul would have undergone would have been something incredible. When you see a flash conversion, you know, generally those don't happen. Because conversion, you have to be a free participant for a real conversion to take part. You have to be a free participant that's going to cooperate with God. He's not just going to force you and ram conversion on you because then you're not free. So St. Paul was somebody who was radically, totally convinced, I am right. The people, the faith of our fathers is right. These people are heretics and they are destroying the faith and people are probably going to hell because they're following this sect that follows this Jesus guy who considers himself the Messiah, who called himself the Son of God, scandal of scandals, and he's chasing after these Christians with permission to bring them back in chains uh, and to torture them, says this, uh, you know, if they will not confess, to force them to confess and or even to the point of death. This is who, Saint, who Saul was. And as he's on this trip, he gets blasted by this apparition of Jesus. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's like, I don't even know who you are. I'm not persecuting you. 
I mean, clearly, this angelic, mystical, glorious being, Saul's like, if I'm going to pick a fight, it's not going to be with you, okay? <laughs> um, it says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, and you are persecuting me. This gave Saul his first great insight. Saul is like, I never once persecuted this guy. I persecuted his followers. And he made the connection. When I perse Jesus lives in his followers. And when I persecute them, I, he considers that I'm persecuting him. This is the beginning of his doctrine on the mystical body, which is one of the great doctrines that we have as a church. When you get baptized, his life lives in you and you live in him through grace. Okay, that's one of the most fundamental things that we live as Catholics. Okay, so St. Paul later on spends a year and a half in Antioch. Barnabas goes and gets him. Barnabas was like a peacemaker kind of guy. Um, he had a famous nephew, by the way, whose name was St. Mark, who's going to pop up later. Um, Barnabas was from Cyprus, which is Greek. And um, St. Mark was from Cyrene, like Simon the Cyrenian, which was modern-day Libya, but again, Roman Empire, okay? Hebrew colonies halfway across the Mediterranean. And they get this, through these prophecies, they said, set Saul and Barnabas aside for the mission I have for them. And they start going into basically modern-day Turkey. The Galatians, the Phrygians, uh, they go to Troas, they go to any number of places, uh, and they do their first apostolic mission. They have great success, they come back, they do their report on it, everyone is excited, even the Gentiles, this was revolutionary stuff. God has sent them, and they're not just preaching to Jews anymore. And this was a big revolution for the Catholic Church, because up until this point, the Jewish people, the idea was this, we are the chosen people. And frankly, if you talk to any Hasidic Jew in Brooklyn, for example, same mentality. I was on a flight full of like 20-some um, of them on the flight to Turkey. Um, they weren't going to Turkey, they were going to Amsterdam. But uh, we are the chosen people. Everyone else is not. That was the mentality. You may choose to try to join us and become one of us, because that's possible. Uh, but ours is not a faith that goes out into the world. It's like, you're either with us or you're against us, and, uh, and that's it. All of a sudden, this new church, Christ is telling his church, go out into the whole world and evangelize, and he's telling them, convert the pagans. They can come on in. Uh, it was something new. Um, so they had great success. After they, and they brought with them a fellow by the name of John Mark, St. Mark. On the second missionary voyage, Mark was also with them, but about halfway through, he bailed. Mark seemed to be a funny personality, in this, and he's probably somebody that we can, a lot of us can empathize with because he had his ups and downs. Some scholars think that the rich young man in the gospel, where it's like um, he went away sad because he had many possessions, you remember him? Yeah. Some people think that was St. Mark. Some people also think, and with good reason, uh, some people also think that he was also the same guy who only appears in Mark's gospel. That's usually a telltale sign of who it is. If some mysterious person appears in only one gospel and he's doing something really stupid, it's usually the author. <laughs> um, the guy who in the Garden of Olives, when Christ got arrested and they tried to grab him and he ran off naked, he left his clothes behind, same, a lot of people also think that was St. Mark. Only St. Mark's gospel mentions it. So you've got this young idealistic guy who nonetheless, he feels the tug of the world. And he fluctuates and goes back and forth. But with the grace of God, became one of the pillars of the church, gospel writer, founder of many churches, and martyr. So not a bad itinerary, despite his weakness, okay? So anyway, he bails, and St. Paul, well, anyway, Paul and Barnabas continue, but then when Paul wants to do a third missionary voyage, Barnabas wants to bring Mark along. Paul says, absolutely not. It causes a fight. Barnabas and Paul break up this dream team, and you never hear about Barnabas again. He went and did great things. St. Mark, interestingly enough, became the assistant to another great disciple, whose name was St. Peter, and most people consider that the Gospel of Mark is really the Gospel of Peter through Mark, um, just the way that St. Luke's Gospel is largely the Gospel of St. Paul. 
the Blessed Virgin, he, he would have known the Blessed Mother well, and he would have known St. Paul, but a lot of it would have been through them that he was giving his, his gospel, right? Um, and then St. Paul, uh, well, anyway, in the second missionary voyage, something important happened. So they were in Turkey, like usual, and they got as far as the city of Troy, Troas, as it's referred to. And Paul sees a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come to Macedon and you know, preach to us. So Paul jumps on the next boat. That's where St. Luke apparently jumped on board, because St. Luke is writing the Acts of the Apostles, and he says, Paul did this, Paul did that. Once they land in Macedon, it says, then we went to, mm -hmm. so from that moment onward, it's a we. Um, and he, the, one of the first places he went to is a town named Philippi. Okay, before I get any further, because I know you're just me dying for pictures, before we get into Philippi, see if you recognize any people here. <laughs> okay, this is just random pictures, that's not Philippi. Um, that's actually Rhodes. That's Corinth. That's uh, Meteoria with the cool monasteries in the background. I don't know what Ronan and... Uh, What's her name? We're doing over in the corner being vain. Instead of joining the group, they had their own picture, but anyway. Um, that would be Ephesus. That I don't remember. Uh, actually, I do remember. That's, that's actually the place where Paul, I think, landed <coughs> in Europe, if I'm not mistaken. And that's a black screen. So um, when he got to Philippi, what happened? This is there, I'm going to highlight three different places that we visited, okay? Paul gets to Philippi and he starts preaching it and he had a regular pattern which was he would go to the Jewish synagogues start <coughs> preaching debating engaging in conversations about Jesus being the Messiah inevitably some people would get excited want to follow him other people would get upset usually the, the people in charge of the synagogue eventually there would be some sort of riot or something and he'd get in trouble now in Philippi in particular as Paul was traveling around, there was this one guy who had a slave girl. I forgot to mention this on Tuesday. The guy had a slave girl who was possessed by a quote-unquote prophetic spirit. Now, frankly, the demons cannot give prophecies, but demons are smart, so they can make it look like they are prophetic because they can usually figure things out um, ahead of time. So this guy has a slave girl. Now, automatically, what does that mean? To him, he doesn't care about the girl. She's a possession. And he made money off the slave girl because she would give quote-unquote prophecies. So St. Paul and Barnabas are going, and Luke are going through town and doing their whatever. For days, this lady is following them, preaching out to everybody, these people have a message of salvation, you should listen to them, which sounds on the surface like, you know, she's supporting him, right? Now, here's the thing. If I were preaching and I had some raving lunatic following me for days saying... <laughs> Listen to him. He's a great preacher. I was like, you know what? You're not helping. So finally it says, St. Paul got fed up. This is after a few days. Of it. He got fed up and just right in front of everybody, in the name of, basically, I think he said the words were something along the lines of, shut up. <laughs> in the name of Jesus Christ, leave her. And immediate exorcism. You know, everyone's blown away. Who is this guy? Exorcisms with ease. Exorcisms are us. Okay, what happened then? You would think if the owner of the slave girl cared about her at all, he would be happy. No, now he just lost his income. And that guy started causing problems, saying St. Paul or Paul is a problem, and he's preaching against our religion, which he was, and he's causing problems, and he's a menace to society, etc., etc. So he gets dragged into prison, he and his followers get dragged into prison, beaten, thrown into jail, and that night, now you'd normally think a Roman beating was supposed to be like the closest thing they could give you to death penalty without killing you. It was, it was, a, it was not just a nice a little slap on the wrist. A, a good Roman scourging was heavy duty stuff. Saul and his followers are scourged, thrown into jail, and it says they were singing psalms and praising God in the prison and all of a sudden there's this huge earthquake and all the doors get blown open the roman guard in charge of the prison is about to commit suicide and jump on his own sword because that's what you do when prisoners escape 
he was convinced they're all gone, I'm dead, got to jump on the sword. Paul, who had just been beaten unjustly by this guy a couple hours earlier, says, stop, we're all here. At this point, the guy's like, okay, <laughs> blown away. And at that moment, this Roman guard takes him into his own house, bathes their wounds, throws a meal, is baptized with his entire family, and he has his first converts. How beautiful is that, right? The next day, they wanted to bring him to trial, and he says, oh, by the way, we happen to be Roman citizens, which means that people who did it could probably be all put to death, I think, uh, at least severely punished. So they were like, oh, God, please don't bust us. Please just go. So he goes. Um, so that was Philippi. Anyway, places visit him. Totally out of whack, but anyway, here's some of the places we saw before we get back to Philippi and Berea. Look at all these cool spots. Okay, there's Philippi. So Philippi was one of the more prosperous Roman towns. Um, there's a picture of Paul and the guys in prison singing their psalms. I can only read a couple words in the Greek, but anyway, Greek is not my thing. There's the prison of St. Paul. And there are a couple of your parishioners <laughs> walking with purpose ladies looking at the prison. And there's Ephesus, which we're going to look at later. Um, okay, next we will go to Ephesus, okay? Ephesus was a very cool place. Um, I kind of put it in reverse order. Like, my favorite was Corinth. My second favorite was Ephesus. Ephesus um, was one of the biggest and wealthiest towns in the Roman Empire. I think it was number three uh, in terms of, like, wealth and influence in the Roman Empire. It's in Turkey. And the reason it was so influential was you've got these big hills up here, and Ephesus at the time was a seaport, and all the topsoil was continually washing down, so it was incredibly fertile. And they had four growing seasons per year. You can imagine 2,000 years ago what that would mean for your economy, being able to grow stuff all year long, continually. So logically enough, in Ephesus, that was where the biggest temple in the Roman Empire to the goddess Artemis, or Diana in Rome, in Latin, who was the goddess of fertility, right? especially like land fertility was. And it makes sense. You're in a place where they have this great devotion to her, great worship, and everything around there grows great, and it's totally rich, and it seems like, well, the more we worship her, the, more, the richer we get, the more blessed we are. Clearly, she's here doing her thing. So St. Paul, being St. Paul, guess what he does? Goes straight to the temple. Well, first he starts with the synagogues, <laughs> okay? Starts converting people, and then starts in the public square engaging in people uh, who are instrumental in the worship of the goddess Diana, or Artemis. He spends a couple of years there, and he starts converting a lot of people. The usual thing happens. Uh, Uprising, gets accused, involves beatings, gets thrown into prison, spends a long time there. Um, I don't remember which letters he wrote. He wrote at least a couple of letters from Ephesus. He'd been there a couple of different times, actually. In particular, was a guy named Alexander the Coppersmith, and they actually have a stone in the downtown that where we saw with the inscription because he was an important guy. Alexander the Coppersmith made, imagine this, images of Diana, so therefore... When all of a sudden people stop buying his images and that whole area of the economy starts disappearing, he got upset and really was behind um, the uprisings. What does that say about St. Paul, though? St. Paul was absolutely fearless. And the reason he was so fearless was that his conversion was not halfway. I was telling you earlier that he was so totally convinced and he had to change absolutely 180 degrees when it became clear to him, I had it wrong the whole time. Okay, that means that Paul had died to himself. And when you and I have really, and this is what saints are like. When you read the stories of saints, especially martyrs, and you read it, it's like they just don't care. You torture them, you threaten <coughs> them, you do all these things, and they simply don't care. How do you get that? Well, they have died to themselves to such a degree, and they live only for Christ. So St. Paul would look for 
the most influential, the most difficult, the biggest challenge possible, because he was convinced if I if I can win this over for Christ, you know, that was his only concern, was being able to do whatever is going to be most effective. It never took himself into account. So, um, Father Eric, yeah, was were the Blessed Mother and John there when he was there? They came later. Now this is this is Mary's house, and this is your walking with purpose people. Some of them, actually, these two are not. But they're on my pilgrimage. That is the house of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Later on, after the church was founded, uh, Ephesus will appear in the Book of Revelation. For example, it's one of the seven churches that um, Jesus spoke to in the in chapter two of the Book of Revelation. You know, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, say this. To the angel of the church of whatever, say this. Uh, it was one of the so one of the original seven big ones. It was Turkey, by the way. We think of it as an Islamic country, and it is. But in the early centuries, it was like the seedbed of Catholicism. The seven first church councils, you know, like Vatican II, but back in the first centuries, all took place in Turkey. Ephesus had one of the church councils. After Saint Paul had established the church. Several bishops later came a guy by the name of John, Saint John the Evangelist, right? The gospel writer. He became the bishop of Ephesus for a while, and he, as we know, was given charge of taking care of the Blessed Mother. A couple miles outside of town, way up on this hilltop, and the town was down below, is this place, which is the house of the Blessed Mother. So we visited there. We did not get to spend much time inside because, like most holy places, you're allowed to go in, don't take pictures, look around real quick, and leave. You know, you'd like to be able to go and spend a long time, but you can't. Is but that, we did, sorry. Is that the house of the Blessed Mother where she grew up? Or no, 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 no. The, the one where she grew up, which presumably is the one in Loreto in Italy, oh, picked yeah. up by angels, otherwise yes. known as Italian merchants, and dragged off to Loreto. Yeah. This is the house that she lived in when she was an older lady. And presumably where the assumption would have taken place, although the people in Israel claim that Jerusalem, so there's two different places that claim. I don't know if everyone is... Uh, Oops, there's downtown Ephesus, sorry. That when Jesus was crucified, it was the Blessed Mother and John who were at the foot of the cross. And on the cross, Jesus said to John, take care of my mother, and to his mother, take care of John, either, more or less. Yeah. So, and John was the youngest of the apostles, right? So, yep. He then took Mary to Ephesus. How far is Ephesus from Jerusalem? It was about 263 miles. No, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, I mean, I can only guess. Yeah, 800 know. miles? I don't know. I don't even I mean, know okay, here's the Mediterranean. My phone is the Mediterranean, okay? This is the east. Jerusalem is more or less the halfway point. Ephesus would be up here. Right. So, so why did they go to Ephesus? It was one of the most influential parts of the Roman Empire. Uh, okay. So well, why St. John went there, I don't know. But St. Paul had founded a flourishing church there, and it was a very important place for Catholicism. Maybe they felt safe there. Um, I don't think, if they felt safe, that's probably the last place John would have gone, knowing him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John was every bit as fiery as St. Paul, just uh, in a different way. <laughs> um, he was called son, one of the sons of thunder for reason, right? <laughs> so anyway, this is downtown Ephesus. To give you an idea, there's actually more of it. You can hardly see because this picture is very bad. Here is an amphitheater that, had, that was capable of holding 35,000 people. That's a big town. Um, and then these rocks and stuff was that one stone where you see the inscriptions of Alexander the coppersmith who had you know he was trying to make himself important he dedicated such and such a building here and you can see the inscription that he made to himself so he was an important guy finally the coolest of all the cool Corinth you recognize any of your people there uh, there's Jean I think she's uh, anyway there's a bunch of you guys there um, There's some guy that's <laughs> celebrating Mass in Corinth. I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> He's some dork. Okay. <laughs> okay, 
where I'm standing is actually kind of significant. Um, Corinth was another place, you hear about the letters to the Corinthians. It was also one of the biggest and most important cities in the Roman Empire. It's in Greece. I would have to look at the Greek geography again, but it became important because it's kind of a funny spot. You've got this Greek peninsula coming down and doing whatever the shape it is. But where Corinth is, it's this little narrow strip of land, this little isthmus, probably about five miles wide between two seas. You have a sea down here and a sea up here. And it became important because sailors figured out, instead of sailing all the way around and doing whatever they had to do, it's easier if we just sail here, drop stuff off, somebody hauls it to the other side and a different boat takes it on. So it became prosperous. Uh, it became a port with a lot of sailors. And therefore, it was the most convenient place ever to have the Temple of Aphrodite, the god of, goddess of love. You know, carnal love in particular, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's very convenient. You have hundreds of sailors running around and 800 plus priestesses of Aphrodite, which is a nice way of saying sacred prostitutes, uh, serving the men. St. Paul appears in the place where they would come down was this hill. They had their you know, whereabouts up there. The temple, the main temple up, was up there. And they would come into the town and try to you know, get customers. Um, so the idea was this. St. Paul arrives, begins preaching faith, and obviously there's this flourishing sexual cult going on. And it's, sexual cults tend to, for obvious reasons, be very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, people get attracted to that form of faith. Go figure. So St. Paul appears, and he starts converting these young ladies. Because all of a sudden, here's a man who looks at me differently than anybody's ever looked at me, than any other man at least. And he preaches them this message of freedom in Christ, and treats them with a dignity they've never been treated with before, and they start to really convert. One of the things which I had no clue about, but it's kind of interesting to me, was as a way of kind of keeping the women, even though they were supposed to be sacred, they were also simultaneously subservient to the people that they were offering services to, so they would have shaved heads. And St. Paul, one of the ways to do away with the shame of that was, he said, wear a veil. Now that's not the only explanation because St. Paul himself has a different explanation in one of the letters somewhere, which I don't remember where, but I thought that was very interesting. It was actually a way of giving dignity to these women and kind of covering up the mark of shame, so to speak. Um, now, what happens when a guy like St. Paul comes and starts converting all these 850 priestess women? Uh, there are strong economic and political interests at stake. So again, people start their big uprisings, both Jewish and pagans, because there was a Jewish colony there as well. Um, I don't have a picture of it here, but there's, we, Ro can tell you, we're in front of this little stage called the Bema. Uh, we have pictures there, you don't remember. Um, you were busy looking for cats. <laughs> <laughs> Ro and Peter discovered every cat in the island in Greece. Um, and it appears in the Acts of the Apostles where uh, the pagan people said, this man Paul is causing civil disruption and t telling us to worship other gods and you know, destroying the galactic harmony and all that stuff. And they start this giant riot and the Roman procurator says, sorry, this is not my thing, okay? If he was breaking, if he stole or something like that, I would punish him. Religious questions don't get me involved. But nonetheless, this riot lasted for hours. And they actually grabbed poor Sosthenes, who appears in the Acts of the Apostles, who was one of the synagogue officials who probably converted under Paul. And they beat him right in front of the Roman procurator. And he just says, you know what? Not my problem. He just didn't want to get involved. So Paul actually got away without a beating this time somehow, which was miraculous for him. He always seemed to get beatings. Um, but he managed to. And then, as usual, they said, Paul, get out of here while you still can. Stuck him on a boat. And he went wherever he went. Um, but again, you see St. Paul, this great witness who goes straight for the center of power. He never shied away from bringing the message of salvation 
to the center of power, so much so that when he was dragged later on in the Acts of the Apostles back to Jerusalem to be held in trial um, before the Romans, uh, he, he said, I am not going to be held, held in trial before the whoever in Jerusalem. Bring me to Rome because he wanted to be able to preach to Julius Caesar, or to Caesar Augustus. His only goal is that he's going right into the lion's den. I want the chance to preach to the leader of the Roman Empire, which he never got, but, um, and then that's where he was eventually martyred, okay? Different theories as to if he was martyred then or on a, a subsequent missionary voyage. It seems like he may have actually gotten as far as Spain even one time, um, but. How long did he spend in prison? Two years. Two years. The seemingly, it's, not, it's a little fuzzy, but it seems like he spent two years in prison in Rome, was set free because there was nobody to really accuse him of anything. He went off, did more traipsing around, came back another time, and that's seemingly when they got him. They said, oh, it's you again. <laughs> so Was he crucified? He was beheaded. He was oh. not crucified because he's a Roman citizen, and oh, crucifixion right. was too horrible. St. Peter, on the other hand, was not a Roman citizen. He was just some hick. So he got sentenced to crucifixion, and he said, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. Wow. And if you look at St. Peter's Basilica, the spot where, where St. Peter's Basilica is, which if you want to know, just happen to have, there you go. Next year? Because maybe next year. <laughs> Anyone who wants to go with me, I'm kicking around the idea right around this time next year of going, doing a Rome trip. I know Rome very well, unlike Greece. Um, on the left side, under this wing, at the time, that was outside of the old city of Rome. And St. Peter's Square and everything was a big oval racetrack. And they were doing things like lighting Christians on fire as they had a horse race racing around them and doing things like that. St. Peter was crucified upside down under, in the middle of the racetrack under what would be the western or the left side of the basilica far back. You know how the basilica is a cross shape? And there's an altar there, which is kind of like the closest point you can be seemingly to where he was crucified. And when they did excavations during World War II, um, to say, hey, is St. Peter really buried here? Pius XII was like, I've got nothing else to do because they were all imprisoned in the Vatican. And they did all these excavations and they dug and dug and dug and got under the main altar and they found bones of a man. And in subsequent years, they've been able to identify he was a Palestinian. He died around the age of 65-ish. He had arthritis. He was stocky and strong. And he's missing his feet. Oh. Why would, he, why would he be missing? And he's from the first century. They can figure all that out by analysis. Why would he be missing his feet? What's the easiest way to take down a man who's been crucified upside down? He was a slave. Let's cut him down. So, there you go. I don't remember who was... Are those the 12 apostles up on the top? I don't remember... Well, those are all kinds of random saints. I don't remember who they are. Okay. St. John the Baptist is up there. Uh, it looks like St. Andrew, but it's all kinds. Of, it's not Got just it. the 12. Um, and then there's the colonnade has a whole bunch more. Mm -hmm. So if, say, if Michael, or sorry, uh, Bernini liked you, you got a statue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Any, uh, anybody have any questions?